According to a United Nations study, Cuba's regular schools rank at the top in Latin America. Old mansions were converted to classrooms. Under pictures of gun-toting revolutionaries, children are taught Cuban history, along with computer skills, English, and all the basics. For a developing nation, the literacy rate is exceptional at 96 percent, according to the U.N. Another success Cubans point to health care. Beginning in neighborhoods like this one, inside a house or an apartment building, you'll find a community family doctor. In this doctor's case, he serves 550 patients. Other doctors serve up to 800 people. But the bottom line is every Cuban has a primary care physician. Doctors get to know their patients and even make house calls. They emphasize prevention and follow-up. Again, according to the U.N., 96 percent of one-year-olds are immunized. Life expectancy is just one year less than the states at 76. Cuba may not have the nicest facilities or equipment. Medicine is sometimes in short supply. But everyone has access, and the concept of paying is completely foreign. It's unpaid, totally unpaid. We never say that it's unpaid because it's, so, it's something that we was born with this right. Though the country has a lot of problems, it's hard to deny they get results in certain areas. In the last three Summer Olympics, Cuba, an island with only 11 million people, has finished near the top in the medal count. Coach Rodriguez tells his team, you have to think big to get big results. For Castro, freedom starts with education. And if literacy alone were the yardstick, Cuba would rank as one of the freest nations on earth. The literacy rate is 96 percent. Frankly, to be a poor child in Cuba may, in many instances, be better than being a poor child in Miami. Oh, Eleanor, and I'm for God's going to sake. condemn El their lifestyle now you're sure oh, please. Please. This is where the man became a myth. The stunning, secretive maze of the Sierra Maestra Mountains, the cradle of the Cuban Revolution. Fidel Castro emerged from here talking and shooting his way to center stage almost 40 years ago. The U.S. government has spent billions trying to get rid of him. He infuriates, he fascinates, and as politicians go, he has lived in the spotlight longer than anyone around. Yet, for most of us in America, he's still pretty much a caricature. A beard, the now gone cigar, a green uniform. Tonight, CBS reports takes you into the heart of the myth and the life of the man. Many outside of Cuba call him a dictator and worse, but here he is Comandante, Compañero, or most often simply Fidel. 400 miles east of Havana, Fidel Castro and I met to recall the days he spent here. We are in one of the main places here in the of our struggle. We walked the paths he'd walked before. This is the Cuban Revolution's holy land. From these mountains, Castro's guerrilla army took a dream and gave it life, made it known in every village, made it real in every home across Cuba. Cuban President Fidel Castro cast his vote in Sunday's national and provincial assembly elections with enthusiasm. No dubious campaign spending here, no mudslinging, and even less doubt about the outcome in elections where there's no competition. That's because there are as many candidates as seats to be filled, all of them by supporters of the communist government. A system President Castro boasts is the most democratic and cleanest in the world. <laughs> Here, there will not be an investigation launched a month from now to find out where all the money came from to finance the elections, as happens in other countries, especially that of our northern neighbor. In Santiago, as all over Cuba, the turnout was high in this country where voting is not mandatory, but expected. Polling facilities were provided even in hospitals to ensure the sick could vote in elections which are conspicuously being held just days before the arrival of Pope John Paul. It's a difficult question because I didn't know we were in the information society.